Good morning, everyone. How are you doing this morning? If you would, please introduce yourselves. Tell us where you are speaking from. Give us about one minute of what your company does. And also let us know what a good lead is for you. I'll start with the way I see you on my screen. Rhoda, if you would, please. Good morning, CBNers from Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, Rhoda here from Say It For You. And we, my team and I, write what you read when you go on our clients' websites. And we are interested in showing visitors, and there will be visitors, no matter how you meet your clients, whether through referral or personal introduction, um, networking, whatever means, sooner or later, they are going to check you out on your website. And so our task is to make you appear that you're in the now and in the know, and that you have current information that is shows that you're, you're in the community, that you're working now, and you understand some of the issues that are coming up today. So a good referral for us would be uh, the surrounding issues of today, which are hiring. So any business that is interested in attracting employees. And I know that the uh, a friend of mine works for a, a retirement community, a, a, re, a rehab facility in a retirement community. That would be a very good referral for me because they need to attract people and explain why that's a good place to work. So Rhoda, and we say it for you. You may contact me. I just learned that we should end this way. You may contact me through sayitforyou.net, through LinkedIn or Twitter. Thank you, Rhoda. And, you, and those of you who have the directory, you can contact her through the directory. All right, Adele Bush, please. Good morning, everybody. My name is Adele Bush, coming to you live from Columbus, Ohio. My business is ASB Business Services, LLC. We do personalized, customized, and exclusive executive telephone outreach. We also do business research and prospect development. Our calls always, always, always focus on business development, never telemarketing. A good referral for me would be a business that believes and perceives in the high value and the positive impact that telephone outreach can have on their business. We offer a wide range of services, different types of calls that we can do for your business that'll help you be the success that you are or more successful. So I'd love to talk with you, Adele Bush with ASB Business Services, LLC. Thank you, Adele. David Garrison, please. Good morning, I'm Dave Garrison. I live near Martinsville, Indiana. I'm a loan originator which, with Mutual of Omaha Mortgage, and I work with health advisors, their senior clients, uh, real estate agent CPAs, sometimes elder care attorneys, and, and developing strategies to use housing wealth, either to reduce uh, risk and improve longevity in, in retirement planning, or to purchase a home uh, at a discount of something like 50% to the cash value of the home and, and financing the balance of it with a mortgage, you don't have to pay back. So a good referral for me is really any of those, uh, or you know, those of you that are younger out here, their parents that perhaps might be challenged in their retirement income years, that would, would like to look at a solution that involves utilizing housing wealth. Thank you, David. Gloria, please. Good morning, Gloria Thomas from Columbus, Ohio. I am with Secret, the lifestyle company. We help people look better with minerals from the Dead Sea, feel better with clean organic nutrition, experience the world through Club Secret, and have a glorious lifestyle. The whole idea behind what we do is to help people live better. Um, and you can't do that if you don't feel good within yourself um, as far as nutrition, as well as we even offer um, positive mental attitude and that kind of thing through Club Secret. Um, a good referral for me would be anybody who has issues with sleep, energy, weight loss, or um, discomfort. I'll put it that way. Um, so again, uh, Gloria Thomas with Secret, a lifestyle company. Nick Sullivan, please. 
Good morning, everyone. Nick Sullivan here in sunny Raleigh, North Carolina. Sullivan Business uh, Solutions. You know, we always hear the saying cash is uh, king for uh, business owners. I help identify federal uh, programs and tax incentives that uh, can bring more cash into uh, businesses. Uh, many businesses, most business owners aren't aware that they own a commercial uh, building. That could be a source of extra cash. Uh, there's a term called cost segregation, which can accelerate the depreciation, offset a tax liability. So the money going out stays in your business and you can use it for other uh, things. That can be a, often 10 to 15% of the value of the uh, building. We can also help if they hire. There's incentives called workers opportunity tax credits, or we retain workers during this COVID employee retention credits, which could be thousands of dollars even for very small businesses. Small businesses with 10 employees can might be getting over $100,000 in addition to PPP. So it's worth looking into. It takes about 15 minutes to run the software to see where the opportunity lies. And then we have a team of experts with the company I partner with to capture it. Good referrals are CPAs, commercial or real estate, commercial insurance, and open-minded Main Street business owners. Again, it's Nick Sullivan, Sullivan Business Solutions. Thank you, guys. Uh Rhoda, before, before I introduce Rodney, go ahead. I just want to say that there's another category that can help Nick, and I, I tried to make that happen because I included an interview with him um, on the subject of these government benefits in my blog for the estate planning attorney. So I wrote about this. She was interested in, in having me include that so that uh, business owners, and she's also a business attorney, so, so business owners would know about this. And of course, I linked back to Nick's website and quoted what he had said. Well, I appreciate that. And she does her job very well, very well written and, uh, and it came across beautifully. So I appreciate it. No problem. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that's the thing. Make sure you do these intra and inter referrals, uh, uh, you know, because that it helps and you never know. You never know where it's going to uh, end up at. Uh, Rodney mentioned earlier about, you know, he was he it took him a couple of months to develop customers. Uh, my son and I are in a look in a business. It takes us sometimes years to develop customers. So uh, so, yeah, it's just you just never know where it's going to come from. Hey, with that, what I'd like to do is introduce uh, Rodney. And Rodney, you will have full control of the screen. And if you would, it's now the Rodney Wade Show. You are in charge, buddy. Thank you, Keith. I'm Rodney Wade out of Indianapolis, Indiana. I'm with Schooley Mitchell. I'm going to talk about this in my presentation in more detail. Um, a good referral for me would be any company that has a company cell phone. So today I'm going to talk to you about vendor management and cost optimization. I mentioned I'm with Schooley Mitchell. You know, so who is Schooley Mitchell? We are the largest independent cost reduction consulting firm in North America. We have over 325 consultants in over 180 offices. Schooley Mitchell has been in business since 1998 and helped 25,000 clients save over $370 million. We're also completely independent and objective in that we don't accept payments from the providers for our advice. So the advice that we're giving the client is truly in their best interest. <clears throat> Next slide here. So I'm gonna talk to you about some vendor management. So kind of the non-financial aspect, there, there are some slides on that, but also talk about the financial impact of some of your vendor expenses. Talk to you about expense control here. And I really like this quote by Sam Walton, who was the founder of Walmart. He said, control your expenses better than your competition. That is where you can always find the competitive advantage. So take a little example here for a simple high level income statement. You got a million dollars in revenue, 900,000 in expenses. For a profit of 100 grand in your margin for 10 of 10 percent. So what if you could decrease those expenses by forty one thousand dollars? I didn't just pull that number out of a hat. That's actually Schooley Mitchell's average savings for their clients. Your profit would go up to one hundred and forty one thousand dollars and you have a margin of 14 percent. Now, to get those same profit numbers for 
by decreasing the expenses, you would have to increase your sales to $1,410,000, but you also have a, a worse profit margin of 10%. So decreasing the expenses actually gives you a better margin. And this is one of the things that banks look at when they're evaluating loans is profit margins. So all things being equal, the decrease expenses is going to look better than the increase in sales, even though it's the same uh, overall profit. So some industry insights that we've gathered over the years. On average, organizations spend, let's take a guess here. How much more do you think they spend on their services than they need? Anyone can guess. 20%. 20%. Anyone else? 15 35%. Oh, 35. Then in a recent survey, 81% of participating companies had errors on their telecommunications bills. And that's just on one vendor category that Schooley Mitchell looks at. And out of those errors, 98% of them favored the telecom company. They tend to fix the billing errors that do not favor them. But the ones that do, they kind of uh, take their time letting them uh, be fixed. And then organizations spend up to 15% of their operational costs just on telecommunications and merchant processing fees alone. Those are two of the areas that we consult in. We also do waste, shipping, electronic logging devices, e-signatures, utilities. So on our insights out of those 25,000 deals, what percent of clients were not fully optimized? In other words, what percent of the clients were we able to find some savings for? Does anyone want to take a guess? 80%. 80? Anyone else? 100%. You're close. It's 95%. And out of those 95%, 90% of the clients reduce their expenses by more than 18%. Final thing here is 80% of our clients never have to change their vendors to find savings. So this isn't a matter of we're just finding them cheaper rates because they're getting an inferior product. Most of the time, they're not even changing who they do business with. So let's take a look at some tips for negotiating your vendor services. So negotiation 101 says you need to know what you have and what you need. Most companies pay for services they don't need. And on the flip side, though, too, it's almost as bad. You don't want to undersell yourself on what you need. And I'll go into more detail on this when we talk about waste and electronic signatures. But if you buy too little and you're using a lot more than what the package you bought is, most of the time you're going to end up paying less had you, had you just bought the, the bigger waste bin or the, or the bigger package with your electronic signatures. You also need leverage in your negotiation. Like I just said, negotiation 101, the person with the most information usually wins. So you need to do your research, try to get some benchmark data on what you're paying versus what other people are paying. You also need to scrutinize the services. So ask yourself these three questions when you're looking at buying something. Will this improve the customer experience? Will this increase productivity? Will this reduce costs? If you're not getting at least two of the three of these things, you probably don't need it, especially if what you're buying is expensive. Finally, you need to be willing to walk away from who you're negotiating with. Try and have multiple options. I try to get at least three quotes. Also, ask for free features, equipment, or months of service. I just recently signed back up for YouTube TV because I only watch live TV for sports and football is coming back on. I noticed when I signed back on, I got the first week for free in the first three months is $10 less than the normal rate. And then after the three months and one week, I kick into the normal rate. A lot of vendors are willing to offer you these types of incentives in not just your TV package, but your waste or your telecom. And it's just really just a matter of asking. They don't necessarily throw it out there. So maybe if you're trying to negotiate an overall lower rate, they might balk at that, but they might give you a month or two free or a month or two at a, a lower rate or maybe throw something in. Keep going back to the cable deal because everyone's familiar with it. So a lot of times when you used to sign up for cable, they'd throw in HBO free for a few months. That You can get those types of deals with your vendor packages for your business as well. So now let's look at 
contactless payments here. Taking a look at the uh, qualitative side of your EPP payments. So contactless payments are something that you need to consider offering if you're taking credit cards for a few reasons. The first one is they're cleaner. So payment cards in a recent study have been found to be dirtier than public train station bathrooms, which is uh, quite disgusting to say the least. And you don't have to enter in a pin or ever touch a machine with a contactless payment. But the real reason you wanna do contactless payments, the main reason is they're more secure. So for someone to intercept data on a contactless payments, three things have to happen all at the same time. And these are all virtually, this is virtually impossible for a thief to pull off. The smartphone has to be unlocked. The correct payment app has to be open and the phone must be very close to the terminal. So every time a contactless payment is done, a device account number is created that's separate from your card. So the thief literally has to be standing about five feet away from the person and time it perfectly. They just, they're not gonna be able to steal this information. Now let's look at online payment fraud. When I talk about the contactless payments, the online payment fraud has really been on the rise lately. You have a few options here. You got the P2P apps. I say PayPal is the most popular, but they're not as secure. The money sent often can't be recovered if there's fraud. It also makes returns harder on the customer and the company. Fraud is getting more significant every day. The average loss for fraud per organization is four and a half million dollars. There's a recent study done after COVID that said 51% of the companies said fraud prevention isn't being prioritized. 11% said there's a decrease in preventing online fraud. And 81% of the respondents said the business is more susceptible to fraud. So a few things you can do to prevent online fraud, like I mentioned, offer the contactless payments, research what fraud prevention tools each service provides, and also collaborate between your internal fraud team and cybersecurity teams. And if you're a small to medium-sized business, you probably don't have the bandwidth to have your own internal fraud team. So you need to consider outsourcing this to a small to medium-sized outsourcing IT company. If you don't know any, I know about a dozen of them, so I could give you the report. But that is something you, you need to uh, prioritize, especially if you're taking payments online. Next, let's look at what to consider when looking at your internet servers. So you need a functional host of solutions at a reasonable price. And knowing what is most important is the first step. So what is most important when you're looking at this? Location, location, location. Location is not just important in real estate, it's also important when you're looking at your internet server because the connectivity and speed are often dependent on your location and the location of the server. And the location is especially important when consider if you're going to do an on-premise or a cloud solution. So you have two options here, on-premise or cloud. Which one's better? They both have their advantages and disadvantages. With the cloud, you can access it from anywhere. There's no upfront installation cost. You get predictable, regular payments. It's highly secure. There's no maintenance on your part, it's scalable, it can be deployed quickly, and you also get utility savings without powering the on-site hardware. But the on-premise solution does have advantages as well. You're less relying on your business's internet quality. It is actually cheaper over the long term. And you have more control over the configuration, upgrades, and system changes. In general, now there are exceptions to this, but I'd say in general, a cloud solution is better for a small to medium sized business and an on premise solution is better for a bigger business. Again, that's in general. I'm not saying there can't be uh, exceptions. To okay, let's look at your uh, small package shipping. So what could you, what do you need to know about your small package shipping? You need to be specific about your needs. So are you shipping internationally or are you shipping domestically? Certain carriers are better for international shipping than others. You also want to look at your return policy. Are you looking for freight insurance? Does the carrier offer freight insurance? You also need to look at what will the weight and dimensions be, because this can have a big impact on the cost and the speed of service. It can also determine if you use a freight solution like full truckload or less than truckload. So if you have a very odd shaped package that's not easy to pack into a truck, 
it's going to be more expensive than something that can fit in a nice square box. The other thing you need to <clears throat> ask yourself is, are they going to be handling hazardous materials? Do you sell anything like batteries, fireworks, anything that's considered hazardous? Make sure you check with your carrier. Don't just assume that they can't handle hazardous materials because some can that you might not even realize that they do. Schooley Mitchell had a client that shipped fireworks and they went with this sh shipper that kind of specialized in that. They didn't think there were really alternatives there. Well, there actually were, and they ended up switching them carriers and got them a, uh, a better price because they did were able to find one that offered the uh, fireworks shipping. And also need to ask, are you looking for postal or express courier shipping? The postal tends to be cheaper, but the express courier tends to be quicker and more reliable. The final two things you need to look at is accountability. So look for shippers who have the delivery guarantee and have a long history of honoring them. And then technology. You need to partner with a shipper who uses the latest technology so you know where, where your package where your package is. Okay, move on. Oops, waste. So there are four main categories of waste. When I talk about waste in this presentation, I'm really just talking about container waste. The school Mitchell does consulting for any type of waste. So basically anything a business pays to throw away, whether it be shredding, recycling, hazardous waste, such as maybe like oil from an auto dealership, medical waste, but right now I'm just going to concentrate on just waste for containers. I didn't want to do a, an entire presentation just on, just on waste here. So I'm just going to concentrate on the main one here. So there are four main cost categories in waste. So you've got your container, collection, transfer, and landfill costs. So your container costs, the pricing is based on the cubic yard sizing of the container. And you need to know what size you need, and that often comes down to trial and error. Ideally, at collection time, the container will be full, but it won't be overflowing, because that means you got the perfect amount of container size for the waste that you're using. But you're not always going to know that right off the bat. Sometimes it does require some trial and error. You're also going to want to know, are you going to want to rent or purchase it? Purchasing is more efficient if the bin's going to be used for at least 23 months. So if you have an, a permanent location business, you're better off buying the bin. If it's going to be a temporary location, such as like on a construction site, you're better off usually just renting. Then the collection costs, so these are going to vary depending on your location, the container size, and the collection frequency. And again, that's going to come down, the industry research are and some trial and error are the best ways to figure out how often collections are needed. So for example, a restaurant is probably gonna need collections on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, but maybe not on Monday and Tuesday because they're slower. It's just gonna depend on the nature of your business and when you're busy and when you're not. Next, we'll look at transfer costs. These are factored into your waste removal fees. And you're talking about the fuel and the other transportation costs of moving the waste to the landfill. And there are two ways that this is done, direct and indirect, and they're exactly what you think they are. So direct, they're taking the, the waste straight from your premise to a single, in a single trip. Indirect, they're transferring the, the waste to a transfer station, it's stored, and it's batched over to a single landfill site. This is more expensive than direct, but it often can't necessarily be controlled. So you need to check to see if your vendor has any discounted rates with the transfer station. So looking at waste continued, the landfill costs. So this is when waste is disposed of at a landfill, a tipping fee is charged and on average these range from 25 to $150 per ton. And as with transfer costs, many commercial waste vendors have preferential rates for customers at landfill. The final thing here on waste, talking about the hidden costs, and this is the one that I think the customer has the most control over when it comes to waste. The best way to avoid most of these charges is to place the container in the easiest location to collect the waste. Because if the trash company has to do anything, and I mean literally anything besides drive up and dump that waste bin in the back of the truck, they charge you for it. They have dismount and push charges. They have key charges. So if they have to get out and unlock a gate, 
They have enclosure charges, gate services charges. So even if they have to get out and open a gate, they have, this one is quite comical. They call them long walk charges. And the industry defines a long walk as anything over 10 feet. <laughs> so if they have to walk more than 10 feet, they're gonna charge you for it. And then they have certain regulatory charges. Those are more environmental. They're not necessarily um, in your control, but that's just something to keep in mind. So yeah, put the waste bin in the easiest place possible for them to, to get to it. That's gonna save you some money. Next, we'll look at electronic signatures. An electronic signature is a data in electronic form, which is logically associated with other data in electronic form, and which is used by the signatory to sign. There are three main security services with an electronic signature, authentication, data integrity, which is any modification of a digitally signed document, which always results in verification failure and non-reputation. So this prevents the signatory from denying involvement. Research indicates that the electronic signatures actually save an average of $20 per document in a high volume environment. And as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, you need to make sure you're paying for the correct package. This is one area that we see a lot of clients underestimate what they need and they end up paying more. So for example, they'll buy the 100 signature a month package and then they're actually doing 200 or 250 because the next one up is 300 signature package. There's not one in between. They think buying the cheaper, the cheaper one up front is better. And it's not necessarily better because they're getting charged every time they sign over 100 those 100, so from 101 to 250, they're getting charged for that. Most of the time, they're better off just buying the, the bigger package, even though they're, they might not necessarily be signing 300 a month, but they're close enough. It's going to be cheaper for them to buy the, the, bigger, the bigger package there. So next, let's look at fuel costs. Not all businesses have fuel costs, obviously, but the ones that do, this is a big cost for them, especially when gas prices are high. So... Some of the ways to manage your fuel costs here is uh, fuel management software. So this helps track how the fuel is purchased. It tracks how to schedule maintenance, and it also allows for planning the most efficient route possible. Another thing to look at is fuel cards. So these are very good too because th they offer a number of significant advantages. So it allows the manager to track the fuel purchase. It also eliminates non-fuel purchases. So if you just give an employee, a company credit card, they can go buy anything with that. They could go in the, something as innocent as going in the gas station and buying a Coke, to something as, you know, blatantly fraudulent as going and buy a, a TV for themselves. They also can be used to specify what type of fuel you're buying. So not only can it eliminate the fraud on, on non-fuel purchases, but if you want a certain type of fuel and that's the only type of fuel and this can be really good for a company that has a fleet of diesel vehicles where most customers or employees don't, most cars just for personal use are not diesel vehicles. So one of the, even with the fuel card, you do have a chance for fraud with someone pulling up their friend's car right behind it and putting the fuel in. But if you have a, a fuel card that says, okay, you can only buy diesel with this, well, no one, almost no one has a diesel car, so you can eliminate that type of fraud as well. This also saves money and time on uh, processing reimbursements. This is easier to monitor the spend as well for more accurate budgeting. So if you have someone making fraudulent purchases and you're taking that into account in the budget and that person leaves, um, then maybe you're overestimating your budget. But then on the flip side too, if if someone you hire in doesn't turn out to be the most honest person in the world, they're spending more than your budget's going to be out of whack there. Also, you, you can offer many types of uh, discounts in regular promotions on the fuel card if you do business with uh, certain, certain vendors. Another way to uh, get better use out of your fuel costs is driver behavior. There's uh, multiple things they can do to get more fuel efficient. The most obvious one is reducing your top end speed. There's also driver coaching programs that can teach them how to drive the vehicle more efficiently. There's the use of cruise control 
and then decrease idling time, which that goes back to the fuel management software that can help you plan the most efficient route possible. And then also the equipment and proper maintenance. So making sure your tire pressure and rotation is accurate, keeping your air filters clean, making sure you have any the proper wheel covers, gap reducers, and trailer wings on your vehicles. Finally, let's talk about mobile device insurance. So everything I've talked about has strictly been related business to business. This one I actually think can apply to your personal uh, cell phone plan as well. So the question is, should you carry insurance on your mobile device? The answer is almost always no, because its shortcomings outweigh its benefits in almost every situation. You're usually better off just saving that amount of money you'd be paying on the device insurance for a similar device and it could give you more options down the road. Also, if you actually take care of your phone, the likelihood of a phone breaking down that's given proper care is actually pretty small. Phones these days are, they're good solid products. They're not, this isn't 25 years ago that the phone just goes kaput. If you take care of it, you're likely going to be okay. The other thing too is if you're actually really accident prone, the insurer can drop you just like they could drop you for your, for your auto insurance. Um, it, this works the exact same way. So if you have someone or maybe you have a, a kid or someone in your, on your family plan that is really not responsible with their phone, you're not going to be able to file the claim every time and they're just going to keep paying it out. They're going to get rid of you. The final thing too is on this is that most common issues can actually be repaired at the store for cheaper than the insurance. So especially after you pay the deductible. There's also no guarantee of replacement quality on the phone. So most replacement phones are refurbished phones and they might not even be the same model. They could often have a limited battery life and the insurer is under no obligation to guarantee that you get a replacement phone that is the specific and make and model that you have. The final thing is the non-refundable deductibles. These are often quite high and they actually approach the cost of just buying a refurbished phone on your own in the open market. So that's all I have for today. Thank you for taking the time to listen to me. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to, uh, to take them. And you can find me on LinkedIn and or um, you know shoot me a message in uh, my email is just my name rodney.wade at schoolymitchell.com rodney uh, thank you uh, let's give me back my screen hey a uh, couple of things real quick uh it, it's so funny that you mentioned that phone thing uh a lot of people take that phone insurance out and when you have i had a teenager and when you have that first claim you find out drop this stuff quick because it, it ended up being, I ended up paying with the deposit, with all the other stuff. It was like, hell, I could have just kept this money in my pocket. So, you know, just common sense stuff like that. And you need to be reminded uh, of that. So just a couple of things about you and your business. So like, like this is a particularly interesting, but pretty long presentation. So how do you make your pitch when you go out? So, it, I mean, it depends on the situation, uh, you know, like my, my, I don't have a 30 second pitch because I can't explain what I do in 30 seconds. I have like a 10 second one and about a minute one. So my, my 10 second one is just, I help businesses and nonprofits eliminate the stress of managing vendor expenses while ensuring they're getting the best price possible with no upfront fees or risk and without switching vendors. Uh, so it's not just a, uh, it's not just a, a cost savings. We also have a time savings component of it as well. We don't just do a one-time analysis. We stay with the client for three years and they don't have to worry about this for three years. And a lot of our clients find that to be just as valuable as the uh, monetary savings. So after my 10 second pitch, if they're still, if they don't ask a follow-up question then you know, talk about something else. If they do, then I go into my one minute pitch, which just goes into a little bit more detail. I talk about the specific cost categories. So the eight cost categories I talk about how, um, you know, we don't get paid anything by the vendors. We don't, 
we don't make any money if we unless we save them money. So it's a it's like a no risk uh, proposal for them. And uh, as far as my ask for you know who I'm looking for, I'm still working on that right now. I'm concentrating on like I said, the companies with the cell phone plans. It and it also is going to depend on what time of year it is. I would really like to get into like the construction trades. Those are really good clients for me, but. A couple months ago, I was trying to target them and they all like, I remember I talked to a guy, he did an asphalt paving and I uh, talked to him and like, you know, let's give him my little pitch. And he said, he said, I, he said, I'm not saying I'm not interested, but I'm literally working seven days a week right now. I can't even keep up. And I said, okay, this was in June. I said, can I call you in six months? He said, yes, that's fine. So it's, it's some of it's seasonal as well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, when I was in corporate, I, I remember my manager and we had a cost efficiency group. And here's what my manager said. And I think many businesses think it. he said, Keith, it ain't our job to save money. It's our job to go out and make more sales. That's the problem. <laughs> I think a lot of people go, I'm not worried about saving money. If I make more sales, everything will be settling in. And that's the reason I asked you about your pitch, because I think a lot of businesses go, yeah, I'll just go out and try to make more money. Well, I think too, at the corporate level, that's not as, um, you know, when you're working for a billion dollar, I remember I used to work for Walt Disney and I, 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 I figured out a way to save them a million dollars and literally a million dollars. And they're like, thanks. Like, yeah. Like we make dot, that every right. It was the yeah, dot. We, we make that every three minutes. Um, but with a small to medium sized business, one, they don't have the resources to have a team like you were talking about at corporate. And that's why our target market is the small to medium sized business. And then two, when you're dealing with the small to medium sized business, particular most of the time, a smaller to medium sized business, the owner is going to have most, if not all, of their net worth wrapped up into this thing, they absolutely care about saving money because <laughs> it's directly going to go to their bottom line into their pocket. It's not a, like when I was at corporate, I saved the company a million dollars. I mean, I put it on my resume and I got a little, you know, great job, but it, you know, it's not like I, you know, it just wasn't that big of a deal. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Rodney, Roll the police. Um, so how does the client pay? In other words, to what extent do they need to sign up um, for a financial obligation with you in order for you to stay with them for the three years and all these different things? Maybe they don't want to deal with all those different things in ways that they could save money, but they just want, in other words, are they paying for the initial analysis at all? No. So there's no... There's, there's no upfront fees. We'll do the analysis for them. We'll come back. We usually present two or three options to them. And so we'll say, um, okay, here's what we found with your current vendor. And here's what we found with a couple of alternatives. If the current vendor is the cheapest alternative, it's a no brainer. They just sign off. They don't have to do anything and save money. Where the decision comes in is if um, the alternative vendor has a cheaper rate, say the current vendor has come down, but not as much as the, as one of the other options. Then they got to decide, well, do I want to change or do I not? If they do change, we handle the change for them and we don't charge them for it. But sometimes people just get comfortable with what they have. Um, although sometimes some people don't like their vendor that they currently have. They're like, I hate I, I, us talking to a guy the other day. Um, he it actually is one of the clients I got last week. I, um, he owns uh, four restaurants in town, getting ready to open a fifth one. And his phone, I'm not going to say who it was, but his phone vendor, he just was flat out like, these people are crooks. I hate them. I want nothing to do with them. So, I, I mean, um, it, 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 you do get that situation. Not everyone likes a current vendor. But I'm saying just how much involvement would the small business need to do to, for the so what, what we need what we need from them the process only takes about an hour hour and a half so i explain what what we do when they sign up 
we, uh, we only need three months worth of invoices from them in whatever vendor category we're looking at. I don't need your p &L. I certainly don't need your taxes. I'm not gonna look at them if you give them to me. Um, just three months worth of invoices. So it'd be the most recent three months if it's a non-seasonal business. If it's a seasonal business, I would want the busiest month of the year, the slowest month of the year, and then the most recent one. Anybody else got a question? Adele, please. Uh, Rodney, uh, who is your ideal client in, in terms of, of size of employees? So um, it's pretty broad. Uh, I'm not going after like, I actually talked to a guy yesterday. He installs LED lights and one of his clients is uh, Nestle. And I said, I, I'm not, uh, that's just too, they have their own team that does that stuff. So not like a Nestle or a Cummins or an Eli Lilly. Also don't want someone though that just opened their doors. So um, I can't save anything off of zero. So um, really anyone, generally about 10 employees um, and then all the way up to really about, I'd say as much as 2000, because once they get over that, then they start to, you know, like Keith was talking about, they have teams that do this stuff for them. Um, and we can help any industry. There's not, I mentioned Schooly Mitchell's done 25,000 deals. There's not an industry, <clears throat> excuse me, there's not an industry that we haven't uh, worked with. Also, nonprofits make very good clients as well because nonprofits have access to special nonprofit pricing in a lot of these categories, and most of them don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, I didn't get your ideal client in terms of employees. What did you say from one to 2,000? <clears throat> uh, about, about 10, 10 to oh, 2,000. 10 to 2,000. Yeah. Okay. Very good. So I was thinking about doing some research on, on small businesses and maybe I can come up with some prospects for you. Oh, thanks. Well, we'll talk. Yeah. <laughs> Thank Nick. You. Rodney, uh, how's the billing work? Is it, you know, like if you work with a customer in three years, is it a monthly billing? Uh, do, you, do you look at the uh, savings per month or how does that work? So it depends on the client and also depends on the uh, Schooly Mitchell's a franchise. I, I own the franchise. You can do monthly or quarterly. Generally, the bigger clients you're going to want to do monthly. You don't want them. You want to stay more on top of it for them. Uh, it might require more due diligence for a bigger client. Um, but the smaller ones, quarterly. Um, and, but also it depends on what they want to do. So some clients, even a bigger one, they're like, I don't want to look at this every month. Uh, so how about we do it quarterly? But either monthly or quarterly, nothing uh, less than that, but nothing, nothing more. Than that. All right. Anybody else with any other uh, questions? Hey, Rodney, it's really, really interesting uh, and, and funny story. Uh, I was in the printing business for a long time and I learned about those funny deliveries. There's a thing called tailgate delivery, people. For those of you who don't know what that is, that means when you ship on a truck, a big truck, that guy only walks to the back of his truck. From getting it off the truck to your dock, that's a fee. <laughs> so I learned that when I shipped about 50,000, uh, was really about a half a million envelopes, hadn't done that before. And the guy pulls up to the dock and he goes, I don't offload. You got I said, what? So I ended up paying about an extra $400 for that. And, and I could have, if I had known, it could have just been part of the pricing, but I didn't know. So when you were talking about those funny delivery fees about walking 10 feet and stuff, it brought back bad memories, buddy. Bad memories. Yeah, that, and it cracks me up. Literally, it's called long walk feet. Yeah. And it's anything over 10 feet. Yeah. Anyone said, I want to take a long walk. How far? 11 feet. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, no problem. No problem. Hey, appreciate all you guys showing up. Uh, thank you again, uh, Rodney, for, for I, I think, a very interesting uh, concept of like just looking at that clock. That little schedule you did of the uh, Walmart situation, that kind of brings it home to people. You got to sell more or you need to save more. And, and that kind of, uh, that's kind of a quick focus to me. So hey, with that, appreciate you guys being here this week. Uh, we'll see each other next week. We'll work something out. I'm going to dig 
and and beg one of you guys to speak or something like that. But uh, we'll have something, uh, an update from somebody. So I'll see you guys next week. And thank you so much. Bye-bye.